blood is so powerful that it will affect a deliverance from the clutches and the chains of the enemy from the power of sin and from the power of satan and protect the child of god and take him all the way to the end that is the revelation of the blood that is given here my redeemer lives and i will see his glory as he works all things together for my good whatever things i can of this i can be sure i know my redeemer lives i know my My Redeemer, my Redeemer lives, and I will see His glory as He works all things together for my good, whatever. never brought anything paul says you never brought anything in this world what is there for you to boast he says you never brought anything you and i never brought anything in this world everything that we have comes from god therefore i need to live for the purpose for which god gave me all the gifts and abilities that he has given me and you need to do the same thing so we are accountable to god we need to discover god first come in contact with god first give our lives to god first and ask him what we need to do let him guide us and lead us into the plan and purpose and live for his purpose then only we can stand before him so here is the judgment of god going to happen it sounds horrible but it is god says israel is my first born god says in jeremiah i am a father to israel what a god he is i am a father to israel and israel is my first born he says in many ways the israelites are first born in what way to them first god revealed himself to them god chose abraham and revealed it more than to any man god revealed himself to abraham abrahamic blessings are a revelation of who god is and what kind of a revelation or relationship god wants to have with man god revealed himself to abraham in such a way and uh, 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 you know it is it is so important to understand that that israelites are in many way a first born 10 commandments were given to them no other nation received any commandment from god 10 commandments were given to them through that a revelation of god was given to them they knew god better than any other nation in this earth that is why when jesus came he came to the jews he was born as a jew among the jew lived among them ministered among them he said he came to the house of israel ministered among them salvation is of the jews they said from there only it spread to the gentiles and others you first preach in jerusalem then judea then samaria then to the uttermost parts of the world from the jews only it spread so in many ways they are the first born 
So God says, you took my firstborn and made him a slave and oppressed him, killed him, killed their children and did all kinds of atrocities. Now I'm going to, I'm going to send an angel of death and there is going to be a, uh, there's going to be a death of all the firstborn in Egypt. But before that happened, God wanted to make sure this time the demarcation, line of demarcation is very clearly laid out that the angel of death will clearly know who is God's and who is not. How, are this, how is the angel going to find out? So God says, take a lamb for every house. Every father, the head of the house must take a lamb and kill that lamb catch that blood in, the, in, a, in a thing and, uh, and uh, take the blood and put it on the doorposts of their house and sit inside the house under the protection of the blood. When the angel of death comes midnight, he will pass over that house where the blood is smeared on the doorpost. The blood then becomes a sign, is used as a sign to tell who is an Egyptian and who is an Israelite. The blood is used as a sign. Now, this is a very important teaching. The Bible teaches so much about salvation through this event. The sign of the blood was to be placed on the door. The angel is not going to see whether that person is good or bad, not going to stop by and check out his character, check out his record, Check out his face. No. He's not even going to check out whether he's an Israelite or Egyptian. No. If the door has blood, the angel will pass over you. That shows us something wonderful. And that is, the Israelites are not better than the Egyptians. They are just as much sinners as G Egyptians. The way the difference is made between the two is that Israelites' house had the blood on the door. Egyptians' house did not have the blood on the door. The revelation about the blood on the door was given only to the Israelites. They had the blood on the door. Amazing. Think of us. We are not God's children today because we were born in a decent family and we've been pretty good people and lived morally upright and therefore God said, all right, come in, you can be my child. No. We were just as much sinners as everyone else in the world. We were just as much unworthy as everyone is in the world. But God, by His grace, has given His Son for us and His blood has been shed and gracefully He has revealed it to us and we have confessed Him as our Lord and Savior and taken that blood and sprinkled it upon our hearts, cleansing our hearts and our conscience and made us whole. And that is why we are saved today. It is for no other reason. There is basically no other difference between us and others other than the fact that the blood is sprinkled upon us. Now, why it is the blood and nothing else? Because of sin. Nothing else can be a sign. The blood has to be the sign because Israel, uh, Israelites are sinners just like the Egyptians. The only thing that protects them is the blood of the Lamb because God has ordained that sin must be remedied with the shedding of blood and that is why the blood is the sign. All right. So that is why Paul talks about the Passover lamb in that way. He says, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. He literally takes the Passover event and says, our Passover happened when Jesus died on the cross. Just like for those people, that was a remarkable day. That day of Passover observance was a remarkable day because that day they observed Passover. They sprinkled the blood on the door, sat inside until the destruction, destroying angel came and destroyed the firstborn of every house. And then they got out from there and left and journeyed and were set free from that day forever from the bondage of Egypt. That was a major event. No Israelite that has gone through that will ever forget. And Paul says, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Now, for a Christian, the cross is a very major event, very major thing. If you're truly a Christian, if you're, if you're, if you're born again, if you, don't, if you know what salvation means and what the cross means and what the shed blood means to you, you can never think of it in an ordinary way. It is the most extraordinary thing for a Christian. All right? 
God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's how the word pass over came. In the, Jesus in heaven today is known as the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is a term that signifies what he did as the Lamb on the Passover day. All right. So the Bible finds that as a very important thing to understand. So the Passover teaches about the kind of... The, the Passover teaches us many things. The Passover teaches that the deliverance was bought, brought about through the blood of Jesus. That's the great lesson that the Passover teaches. And I want to just mention some of the things that the Passover event shows. Just one by one let me mention. And I want to emphasize a couple of things very strongly here. A couple of, couple of uh, things uh, I want to spend some time on. But I want to mention other things. And other things are most obvious, so I won't spend too much time on it. First of all, the deliverance was brought about or planned by God himself. The deliverance was planned by God himself. It's not man's uh, finding or discovery. The deliverance, the method of deliverance was not man's. It is not that men put together a committee to come up with a problem to solve the sin problem of man. This is not something that you can uh, sit down in a lab and figure out. This is not something that you can sit down in a boardroom and come to a conclusion about how to solve this human problem. Now, we human beings are good at solving many problems, but this is a very special problem. Only God can plan the deliverance from sin and Satan. Egypt and the bondage of Egypt is a shadow of the bondage of people in sin uh, and uh, uh, and, and uh, bondage of Satan, you see. People are in bondage to Satan and bondage to sin. And the Israelites being in slavery in Egypt under Pharaoh, oppressed under Pharaoh, was a picture of that. And deliverance from that is a picture of how God delivers from sin and Satan. So it's a deliverance from sin and Satan. It's not a very ordinary thing. Now you can go to university and study all kinds of subjects. Now there are some subjects that I had never heard about in my day, you know. Some new, new subjects have come, you know. But have you, do you know of any university that offers a subject on sin? You know, no university can teach on sin. I wonder if they even believe on it. They won't teach a subject on sin. They won't teach a subject on redemption because this is something, a subject that is totally different. No university knows anything about it. They can solve all kinds of problems. They, come, they can come up with solutions, but not this one. Because this is a problem that man does not even comprehend very well. What is the sin problem? The sin problem is a very deep, deep-rooted problem. Man is puzzled by it. Even the Apostle Paul says, the thing that I want to do, I'm not able to do. Here is an educated man. He is not lacking in education. He was born and raised in a well-to-do family and raised well religiously. He is not an outright sinner or was not raised in that way. He was raised in a pretty decent family in a religious way. He studied under some of the greatest religious teachers of his day and had the highest of education from the best of educational institutions of that day. Here is the most educated man and he says in Romans 7, he says, there's something wrong inside of me. I don't understand this. Who can deliver me from this wretched state, he says. Exactly, that's how he puts it. What did he find in himself? He finds an inability. He finds that he's, a, he's enslaved by an alien power. Some other power is ruling over me. How does he know? Because the very thing that I want to do, I'm not able to do, he says. You read chapter 7 of Romans, it's the most interesting chapter. The thing that I want to do, I'm not able to do. The thing that I don't want to do, I end up doing. And then he says about the law of God, the law of God is good, holy. Nothing wrong with the law of God. I know it. I've studied it. But I'm not able to do it. Something has gone wrong with me. Sin is in me, he says. I have identified what the problem is. The problem is sin. He says, sin is in me. I'm ruled by a power called the power of sin. 
who can deliver me finally he came to the conclusion about who the deliverer is and who the savior is he says thank be to god through jesus christ he says it is through jesus christ that god delivers that's what he's saying jesus christ is the deliverer so every person the most decent person the most educated person you know sometimes not everybody does murder and lies and steals and cheats and not everybody most people are decent people and some some people are very educated very refined and they behave nicely and so on they don't do anything outright wrong you know they don't go out and do things bad things you'll find many people like that in the world they just don't go out and do wrong things but the question here is not about whether you've done anything wrong the question is what kind of a power do you feel is ruling over you even the best people who have not done anything wrong will tell you even though i've not done anything wrong see people don't do things wrong because there's a lot of restrictions there's a lot of uh, things that keeps them from doing wrong right from the time we go to school there is called moral instruction class so they kind of bring us into line they tell us don't cheat don't lie don't do this don't so we hear this and we in our house also they keep telling us and and so on all this this type of moral instruction is given in every home in all religions in all ways of life and so on this moral instruction is given so we are we are pretty good in that so we know that decent living means that you have to behave and then there is police so if you do wrong they'll catch you so you don't want to be caught for some people there is police in the house itself <laughs> wife is there husband is there and, and so on so there's a lot of reasons why people don't do wrong they feel you know that they'll be ashamed if they did wrong and if they were ever caught and so on so a lot of these things keep them pretty decent you know they don't do wrong that doesn't mean that they don't want to do wrong ah that's where it is that doesn't mean there is nothing wrong in them the fact that they have never done anything wrong doesn't mean they you know they have no capacity to do wrong or they they have no inclination to do, do wrong in fact i will say to you they have inclination and they have a drive to do wrong which they find very hard to keep under check they are having trouble to keep that thing down this drive to do wrong to do some kind of a sinful thing they got to watch out they got to be very careful they got to guard themselves because this thing is driving them from inside sometimes they find that power overwhelming anybody that speaks the truth will tell you that you can contact the best god men you can contact guys who are very religious meditating all the time and uh, doing all these things that they'll say yeah that's the problem that's why i'm meditating all the time you know trying to get away from that evil thing you know that try that thing is trying to get me overcome me this is a problem for me that's why i'm trying to get away from this world get into the woods and get where nobody is and no temptation is i want to get away from all the temptations of this world because this thing is driving me from inside there is a power that is the power called sin because this is such a mysterious power a power that is not commonly understood by everybody and people know nothing about this power know very little about this power they cannot find a solution to this power only god can find a solution to this power because only god knows what kind of power this is that is why god plans salvation that is why god only can plan salvation man cannot plan his salvation so the passover was all planned by god now they are already used to sacrifices i said to you right from the days of coats of skin in the garden of eden they are already used to sacrifice sacrifice is not a new thing they've shed blood they understand if you sin blood must be shed sin results in loss of life sin results in this kind of thing then only remedy can come all of that they have understood right so in order to come and stand before god abel understood he has got to come with a sacrifice that god will accept he will accept only in terms of the blood sacrifice that is why he came with the blood sacrifice that much they knew that to come and stand before god 
I must admit that I am a sinner, that I must give a substitute to die in my place, which shows that I am standing before God and saying, Lord, I acknowledge I am a sinner. Let my sin be laid upon this animal, let it die. Please have mercy on me. That's what the meaning of sacrifice is. But now the revelation is getting higher, bigger. With the Passover, the revelation is getting bigger. It is not, it is not people trying to stand before God. People are under oppression of Pharaoh. They are in slavery. They are in chains. They are slaves of Egypt. They are being oppressed. They are under the power of this terrible enemy. Now they have to be delivered. It's not the issue of whether they can stand before God or not. God already loves them. God has made a covenant with Abraham. He's come down. He's reaching out to them to deliver them. It's not a matter of whether they can stand before God now. It is a matter of whether God can deliver them now. Deliver them from this wretched enemy, this terrible enemy that's been oppressing them. Keeping them under his thumb. So they're learning something new about the blood, I will say to you. They have understood the blood as something that qualifies them before God. That God accepts anyone that comes and says, Yeah, I've sinned. I must die. And I bring this substitute because I acknowledge that I am a sinner. Let my death be placed upon you. God understands that. That's the way they came. But now, the Passover lamb is not just for that. The Passover lamb is about some further things. Something beyond that. The Passover lamb is about God delivering the people, protecting the people, delivering the people, protecting the people not only from the judgment that came upon all Egypt, but protecting the people from the evil that Pharaoh wants to do to, do to these people. Now turn with me to Exodus chapter 11. When God gave this whole instruction about Passover, he tells them, see, just imagine, see, when you read the Old Testament stories like this, because we are so far removed in time and space and culture and so on, you need to imagine being in their position. Suppose you were a slave, your father was a slave, your grandfather was a slave, last four generations you've been slaves. What a slave mentality would come in, just imagine, you know. Just see what, what kind of mental condition you'll be in. And if a man like Moses comes and says, come on, let's read, get ready, be packed and ready to go. We're going to get out of this land. You know what I will say? If I was that slave and my granddaddy and great granddaddy was a slave and that's the only thing I've known, I would say, Moses, are you sure? Don't be playing with us. Already we are having too much work. The last time you, uh, you went to him and told him that we want to go and worship our God for a few days, he increased our work. Pharaoh said, you got time for vacation? I'll give you more work. That's what happened last time. Don't spoil our life, man. Get away from us because if we believed you and if we think that we can just pack up and leave this place, you are fooling us because Pharaoh has got horses, chariots, army, everything. We are just shepherds. We got a few sheep. That's all we got. We, we are not warriors. We can't run. That enemy is a mighty enemy. He's a superpower. He will pursue us. He will catch us. He will bring us back. I am not coming with you. I won't come with you. Because this guy is too much. We can't just, go, just walk away from him. That's, a, that's what a normal slave would have said. So they have to be guaranteed a lot. They have to be given, they have to be given a lot of guarantees and assurances and so on. And uh, so the, what I'm trying to point out is the blood here is revealed as a very powerful thing that will not just help man to stand before God. That is another issue. To stand, the sinner to come and stand before God. It is something more. The blood is so powerful that it will affect a deliverance from the clutches and the chains of the enemy. From the power of sin and from the power of Satan. And protect the child of God. And take him all the way to the end. That is the revelation of the blood that is given here.